Hello, everybody. In today's episode of the podcast, I sat down with award-winning historian and professor of history, Karen Cook Bell. She specializes in studies of slavery, the Civil War and Reconstruction, and women's history. We talk about her latest book, Running from Bondage, about enslaved women during the American Revolutionary Period and their fight for freedom. We talked about life as a female slave during this revolutionary period. We talked about forms of overt and covert resistance that slaves may have taken against slave owners. We talked about the sexual exploitation and abuse of slave women, why some slave women decided to run away, and the difficult decision-making process that that might have been. We talked about maroon communities of runaway slaves the difficulty of telling the history of lived experience, the paradox of slave owners viewing slaves as both property and human beings, the relationship between the founding ideals of the American Revolution and enslaved women, as well as questions of identity and what freedom may have meant for runaway slaves. I really enjoyed doing this one, and I learned a lot in the research leading up to the interview and the interview itself. So I hope you get something out of it, and let's get to it. So I guess maybe we could start with your background in history and your field of study and sort of what brought you to slavery and in particular enslaved women. Okay. Well, I am Associate Professor of History at Bowie State University, and I teach courses in women's history, as well as courses on the Civil War and Reconstruction, and courses on slavery. And in terms of what led me to um, history, I've always been fascinated by history, even um, going back to my teenage years when I would borrow the books of my older brother and sisters and um, read their history books. So I started out um, really loving history growing up in Savannah, Georgia. And that love for history led me to pursue a doctoral degree in history. And um, I've been especially interested in focusing on telling the stories of people who have been marginalized from history and the archives. And um, Women in particular, Black women in particular, have been um, understudied in history. So I wanted to um, focus on their experiences during slavery. And researching my first book um, led me to the stories of women who ran away during the late 18th century. And I wanted to find out how widespread the flight of enslaved women was during the 1700s. So my research led me to the American Revolution, which, according to historian Benjamin Quarles, was the first large-scale slave rebellion in American history. So I wanted to tell the stories of these women who escaped or who attempted to escape bondage during the Revolutionary Era. This is a very broad question, and sorry for giving you a hard one to start off, but I was wondering if you could describe what life might have been like in general for female slaves in particular during this revolutionary time period? Obviously, experiences can vary depending on, you know, geography and and all sorts of different factors, but I wondered if you could give maybe an overview of what life might have been like for female slaves. Okay, sure. Well, slavery was based on distinct economic systems. In the Southern colonies, enslaved women labored on large estates producing rice, tobacco, and indigo. Cotton had not yet emerged as a significant cash crop during the 1700s. In the northern colonies, enslaved women worked on small family farms or labored in the homes of their enslavers. And it's important to underscore the fact that despite the constraints that women faced during slavery, during the 1700s, they did, in fact, find ways to resist their enslavement. 
They destroyed equipment. They faked illness. They made attempts to poison the food of their enslavers. And they also, of course, um, participated in conspiracies to overturn slavery. Um, the New York Slave Conspiracy of 1712, for example, included um, a number of enslaved women. And they also, of course, ran away. And running away was one of the most significant expressions of Black discontent during slavery. I guess in terms of the ways in which women um, lived during slavery uh, during the 1700s, it differed radically from enslavement during the 1800s um, in terms of, I guess, the, the amount of labor required to produce rice and tobacco as well as indigo um, certainly was rather consistent with the 1800s, but there were differences in the ways in which uh, women had um, time and resources. For example, in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia, they were um, producing rice under what's called the task labor system. And the task labor system basically assigned enslaved women and men a specific task for the day. It could be, um, for example, hoeing an acre for that day. And once that task was completed, they had uh, time for themselves to uh, tend gardens or to grow produce, um, to get to engage in other activities outside of labor for their enslaver. And on tobacco estates or tobacco plantations, it was certainly much more um, rigorous in terms of working from sunup to sundown for enslaved women. Tobacco is a labor-intensive crop, which requires um, uh, planting in January and February, and of course, um, sowing and um, tending to the crop during the spring and summer, and harvesting in the fall and into the late fall as well. So it was a labor-intensive crop, and enslaved women did not have um, the same experience as Black women in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia had with regard to um, having time and other kinds of resources to themselves. Um, so in that sense, slavery did vary, of course, from region to region with regard to the kind of crop that was produced and the kinds of, of labor expectations that um, enslaved women, women um, had to um, undertake. Yeah, so you mentioned um, sort of the the labor and the field work and the the ways of resisting that slaves and and women in particular could exhibit. I think a lot of times you just get kind of the basic history. the The big rebellions are in the the history books, the Nat Turners, the the Gay Prosser, and and those types of things. But oftentimes those more subtle ways of resisting aren't always, um, you know, made obvious. And reading through your book, some of the ways that uh, slaves could resist and did resist in everyday life was was definitely an education for me. Yes, and I think that's, that's one of the important um, aspects of slavery that um, is not always discussed in the history books. Resistance could be overt resistance, as in the rebellions that we um, are familiar with, but it could also be covert um, or hidden resistance. And the hidden forms of resistance are just as important as the covert or overt acts of resistance. Women in particular um, found ways and found spaces within slavery to protest the institution and to protest the control that enslavers had over their bodies and over their lives. And, you know, there were numerous instances of women uh, seeking to resist their enslavers' um, control of the, over their bodies 
through various forms of subversive um, activity. And running away is just one of those um, activities that enslaved women engaged in more frequently during the Revolutionary War because of the lack of oversight and authority that the conditions of the Revolutionary War created. You mentioned sort of control over the bodies of slaves, and oftentimes we we think of that as sort of the labor system and, you know, the hard work and and that type of thing. But another thing that you you go over in your book, and again, this is something that I think is probably under talked about is the the sexual element of slavery. So I wonder if you could maybe speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, I guess, you know, we have to really think about the uh, position and status of enslaved women um, during the 1700s. Um, Enslaved women were referred to as uh, wenches, um, which was a contemptible term meant to denigrate Black women as a lower form of female. Um, They were deemed suitable for both agricultural and reproductive labor, and racial animus excluded them from being viewed as good wives and mothers. A law in Virginia in 1662 mandated that children would inherit the mother's status as a slave, and that law was replicated in other colonies. So in other words, slavery was inheritable through the mother. And that gave enslavers every incentive to sexually abuse and exploit their enslaved women. So um, I talk about in my book, for example, how um, William Byrd of Virginia had sought to um, have sexual relationships with a number of his enslaved women. And there were numerous cases when um, planters would purchase enslaved women just for the purpose of breeding them and having additional children with these enslaved women forcing women to have additional children to increase their estates. So the sexual exploitation of enslaved women is an important part of the story um, of American slavery. And the position of women, certainly uh, with regard to not having control over their bodies and being at the mercy of planters, Uh, throughout their lives was one additional factor that propelled women to escape and seek to have a life in freedom versus a life of servitude. And that servitude meant um, being at the um, mercy of their enslaver who would sexually exploit them. Right. So there, there seems like there would be just all sorts of reasons for enslaved women in particular to want to run away. But as you go over in the book, sometimes the the decision making process isn't so easy because, you know, there's other factors. So I wonder if you could maybe talk about that decision making process. I know that might be tough to talk about since you it's hard to get inside the head of someone who lived so long ago. But I wonder if you could talk about what what factors went into making that decision to run away. Yes. Yeah, so I give examples in my book of um, several women who um, sought to escape with their child or children. And for women, that was the biggest challenge for them in thinking about whether to escape um, slavery. Um, would they be successful because they were now going to have their uh, child or children with them who you know, would make the escape more difficult and less likely to succeed. Jenny, for example, um, is a woman that I discuss in chapter um, three of my book. And Jenny was not only um, pregnant when she escaped and she was in her third trimester, according to her enslaver, she was big with child. But she also had a two-year-old daughter named Winnie, 
um, to carry with her when she escaped. So certainly Jenny had to not only find ways of uh, ensuring that she would have a successful escape being pregnant and also carrying her two-year-old daughter with her, but I'm sure a certain um, amount of uh, planning went into her uh, escaping from her enslaver in 1776, the year in which Thomas Jefferson issued the Declaration of Independence. So um, what I emphasize in my book is the ways in which the revolutionary ideals impacted Black women. Um, they heard about these ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that are embodied in the Declaration of Independence from listening to the conversations of their enslavers, as well as through the slave grapevine, which carried information from plantation to plantation. So um, these ideals um, in many ways propelled women to also attempt to escape bondage. So women had to um, not only deal with their children and child going with them, but also they had to contend with you know, the elements extreme heat, cold, um, as well as other environmental challenges. And I think what's um, important to emphasize is that the vast majority of women did not run for long-term escapes haphazardly into the woods, but a great deal of planning went into their escape. They created and developed um, inventive strategies to escape bondage. I talk about um, for example, Margaret Grant, who escaped twice, first in 1770 and again in 1773. In her first escape, she disguised herself um, in men's clothing. She was mixed race, and she sought to conceal her identity by serving as a waiting boy to an English convict servant named John Chambers. So Margaret sought to escape by passing as both white and male um, performing fugitivity in a way that Ellen Craft, another escaped slave, would do decades later. So women escaped bondage um, in, in some very creative and subversive ways. They served as waiting boys and men to men like John Chambers. They impersonated white women, you know, those who were fair-skinned, uh, impersonated white women. They fake physical and mental illness. They, um, in some cases, um, disguised themselves as black soldiers. Uh, they served as spies for the British. And ultimately, many of them boarded ships headed to northern destinations. So the challenges that they faced certainly were um, numerous. And I think that's what's important about looking at women during this period is that because of the chaos of the revolution, they were able to take advantage of that chaos to make attempts to secure their freedom, really by um, any means necessary. Right. So at a certain point in the book, you say that the voices of enslaved women do not always exist where we would like. So it kind of underscores the, the difficulty of your job in this particular case. But the historian's job in general, where you're trying to investigate a topic in this particular case where, you know, the goal of a fugitive slave is to re remain undetected. So they're not going to be, you know, writing a lot of firsthand accounts, you know, giving up their identity and talking about, you know, where exactly they are and what they're doing, because if they get caught, they're going to be subject to punishment, potentially death all sorts of horrible things. So I wondered if you could talk about your historical process and the the types of sources and the types of things you use to try to uncover this story of women running away from bondage. Right. So the the slave advertisements, slave runaway advertisements, um, don't tell us everything about um, enslaved women's escape, but it does uh, reveal a remarkable amount of information, such as the physical characteristics or attributes of enslaved women, where they might have gone. It tells us who they took with them, as well as other significant 
uh, information such as um, the scars on their bodies and and the scars on their bodies really, I think, is important because it tells us about the abuse that enslaved women um, received um, during their enslavement. So what I emphasize in terms of process is that I I try to read, read against the grain um, in looking at these advertisements and imagine the varied meanings behind the silences that are in the advertisements for enslaved women. And a part of it is historical imagination in thinking about what um, life was like for enslaved women who were in the process of fleeing. And certainly um, it is informed by, my process is informed by what I know to be slave women's experiences during slavery and the ways in which the documents that I examine, such as, for example, um, trial records of fugitive slaves can tell us more about their lived experiences. Um, One escaped slave in particular, Ona Judge, who was the runaway slave of George Washington, gave a couple of interviews later in her life. Um, She successfully escaped to New Hampshire and lived out the remainder of her life there until she died in 1848. But before she died, she gave two interviews to um, abolitionist newspapers about her life and about her escape and how she escaped. And what she reveals is that, and this is true for other enslaved women who escape, that they often maintained a network free Blacks who would aid them in their escape. They were able to rely on these networks to facilitate a successful escape. So um, additional information about escapes um, can be obtained from interviews like on a judge, but also from trial records in which enslaved people discuss their life during slavery, uh, why they escaped bondage, and what their experience was while they were fugitives. Yeah, I just think that's that's very interesting, the ways that there's these sort of, as you put it, the silences in history and these these sort of cracks that, that kind of fall through. And sometimes all it takes is a fresh perspective to uncover those cracks and get a new, fresh part of the story, the story of history. And for example, you talk about that with looking at those old newspaper ads that had the, you know, the advertisements for the runaway slaves basically saying, hey, here's what the slave looks like. Here's their name. Here's the description. And if you return, you know, capture and return the slave, here's the reward. And, you know, first of all, as you point out, that indicates that when you read the description and it points out the scars and the, you know, the burn marks and those types of things on the body that would be identification marks for someone to look at. This sort of indicates the the brutal nature of slavery. And and one one other part of it that you point out in the book that I thought was very interesting was that the lengths that the slave owners would go to to get back these slaves that ran away, there's sort of this contradictory hypocrisy going on where in the advertisements, as you talked about, they're calling these women wenches and they're kind of playing into this white man's burden thing where the black women are not as intelligent and they're, you know, not as civilized. And yet here they are going through this elaborate process of putting out these advertisements and, you know, basically demonstrating the lengths that they're willing to go to in their you know, kind of subtly acknowledging the the ways that black women were able to use use their agency and intelligence to outwit them, basically. Yes, and I think um, you know there certainly is a paradox um, to slavery um, in that enslavers treated their enslaved people as property 
while also recognizing that they are human beings. And in the advertisements, we see the human beings who are being um, described very clearly um, by their enslavers um, who want them back um, and who are willing to pay rewards for their return as well as certainly they're paying for the space in the newspaper to advertise for the return of the runaway. So um, certainly the process of seeking to secure a runaway slave um, does become expensive um, for these enslavers. And the challenge that enslaved women face is uh, certainly um, finding ways to subvert the actions of their enslavers throughout the process of fleeing. Yeah, the the paradox of slavery is is a very interesting uh, issue to explore because, um, you know, planners are recognizing the humanity of their their slaves while treating them um, at the same time as, as their property. And I think, again, if we, you know, look at the laws that were passed, um, you know, the laws that were passed really in nearly every colony recognized slaves as property, as shadow property. And the punishments that were given to runaway slaves underscored that they were they were property. Um, some of the most extreme forms of punishment for slaves who were recalcitrant or who uh, sought to overturn slavery included, you know, being burned alive, um, for example, and being broke on the wheel, having the body broken on the wheel. Um, those kinds of brutal punishments um, were inflicted. You know, in thinking about the process of enslaved women running away and the advertisements, um, which basically surveillance the enslaved women, I think, you know, we also have to recognize that these advertisements also reveal the agency of enslaved women. Um, so that paradox and that that contradiction is also um, something that's intriguing. Um, on the one hand, the advertisements are forms of surveillance, and the opposite of that is that it's the also it's a form of of agency for enslaved women. Speaking of paradox, I wondered if you could talk about the the central hypocrisy of the American Revolution. And you did mention this earlier, and it's it's something that gets talked about a lot, I think, in in history classes and in popular culture. But I think it's usually the paradox being that, you know, Thomas Jefferson, Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's supposed to be what, you know, America and the founding documents are all about. And yet, at the time, probably over half the population was excluded from life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And as we know, Thomas Jefferson wrote that while owning slaves and and many of the other founders as well. So there is this sort of central hypocrisy, and it I think it does get, get coverage, but I think it's usually from the the perspective of the founding fathers, where you're looking at the hypocrisy from from that lens. But I, I wondered if you could sort of talk about what was the relationship between those founding documents and this sort of philosophical speak about freedom. What was the relationship between those things and enslaved women from their perspective rather than from the perspective of the founding fathers? Certainly. Um, I think a a really good example of um, enslaved women using the rhetoric of the revolution to their own advantage is the case of Elizabeth Freeman, who was an enslaved woman in Massachusetts who um, sued for her freedom using the ideals that were embodied in Massachusetts 1780 Constitution, which recognized and stated explicitly that all men are born free. 
Um, so that language that all men are born free was used throughout the revolutionary era. Um, and certainly the idea that the American colonists were seeking their freedom from the tyranny of the British monarchy and using words like we are enslaved by the British monarchy did not, you know, go unnoticed by enslaved people. So um, they not only ran away to gain their freedom, but they also used petitions to their legislatures as well as to the courts to gain their freedom. And Elizabeth Freeman sued for her freedom on the grounds that she was born free. And the jury ruled in her favor and, you know, awarded her her freedom and also com compelled her enslaver, John Ashman, to pay 30 shillings and as restitution to her, as well as to cover her court costs. So um, using the language of the revolutionary period was a way for enslaved people and enslaved women in particular to declare their own independence. Um, from slavery and from the tyranny of their enslavers. That's really well put. And I think sometimes when you talk about this topic, you get sort of charged with, by, by certain people, with sort of, you know, rewriting history or, you know, some people will say, well, you can't blame the founding fathers or you can't blame these people because they lived 250 years ago and the, the standards of the time, the morality of the time was different. But yet here you have specific examples of people actually living through that time period. And in the case you outlined there, the a, a black person suing for freedom based on the hypocrisy outlined in, you know, that she outlines in her case and the hypocrisy that we've been talking about with these founding documents. So it's not like this is some, you know, academic question that we're asking 300 years later. This was the lived experience of people through the time who were going through this paradox and recognized it and took action to, to try to make things better. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, I think as we think about the nation's trajectory over the past 250 years, uh, certainly the ideals of, of freedom and equality reign very hollow sometimes. Um, but I think that's one of the remarkable things about um, what this nation was founded upon, um, that it's an imperfect um, democracy striving for perfection. And throughout the revolutionary period, um, Black women were seeking to move the nation forward toward the realization of these higher ideals of freedom and equality um, through their actions, um, through running away, through petitions to courts, um, through freedom suits um, to gain their freedom, as Elizabeth Freeman did. Jenny Slew is another woman, an enslaved woman, who will... In 1765, she sued for her freedom because she had actually been a free woman and was um, kidnapped into slavery. And she uh, sued for her freedom on the grounds that she had been born free. And she also won her case. So um, time and time again, what we see is Black women as well as um, Black men using petitions and using the courts as well as fleeing with their feet, protesting with their feet to help move the nation toward its highest ideals. Something related to that, I think that you talk about a little bit in the book is, and these types of questions are, are definitely interesting for me too, these questions of identity where you are trying to put yourself in the, in the heads of these women who ran away and they they might have these questions of identity where you have these different things pulling at them or whether it's you know relationships with other people their spouse maybe they have children 
maybe they identify as mothers and and then once they escape it's like are they still slaves are they free is there some sort of middle ground i was wondering if you could maybe speak to that a little bit and and kind of talk about those questions of identity that they may have had as they're trying to escape bondage yes um it's an interesting question um this issue of identity because um certainly once enslaved women escaped bondage and were um, living in um, areas of what becomes the United States where slavery is gradually abolished in the northern states, the question of identity becomes important because um, they are seeking to pass as free women in these in these northern cities, as well as in the major southern cities, um, such as Charleston and Savannah and New Orleans, which have significantly large free black populations. And um, in these cities, um, fugitive women are able to uh, perform, I guess, um, freedom by dressing as free people as by dressing that as free people, but also by having certain skills that will portray them as free um, people. So the idea of performing freedom becomes an important um, way for enslaved women to show that they can blend in with the free Black population and use their networks, their um networks with other Blacks to um, make the case that they are, in fact, um, free persons. I think um, when we think about this issue of identity and uh, performing freedom for Black women who reach cities where slavery is being gradually abolished, I think we have to think about the Constitution and laws that were passed to make the return of fugitive slaves possible. Article 4, Section 2 of the Constitution, for example, has a fugitive slave um, provision where slaves can be returned to their enslavers. Um, The Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 gave enforcement power to the fugitive slave clause in the Constitution by also mandating the return of fugitive slaves. So the fugitive slaves who um, are able to live in these northern spaces as well as in these southern spaces and perform freedom always live under the threat of possibly being returned to slavery. Um, On a judge who I mentioned earlier was a fugitive slave for, for George Washington's estate and the Washingtons used the Fugitive Slave Act to seek to return on a judge to Mount Vernon. It was only after Washington's death that Ona Judge could, you know, um, breathe a sigh of relief. Um, But even then, she was a dower slave and she belonged to the estate of Martha Washington. And Martha Washington had willed Ona to her granddaughter. So she wasn't completely safe, but um, she did manage to live out the remainder of her life in New Hampshire without being pursued at, you know, pursued from the Washingtons um, after George Washington died in 1799. I think it's just kind of interesting that this, the entire concept of freedom is not, you know, not as cut and dry as you might think it is. And there's sort of this, you know, looking over the shoulder fluidity to uh, freedom for, for people who were, you know, trying to to move towards that ideal, as you were talking about, which uh, you certainly have to feel for, for those people at the time. Um, and maybe just one more question I wanted to, to throw at you. This concept of maroons, um, this was not something I knew very much about before reading your book, but I wondered if you could talk about the the process of how runaway slaves sort of created these maroon communities, particularly in the South? Right. Um, One important outcome of the revolution was that it does increase um, 
what we call uh, marinage, um, where fugitive slaves um, form independent communities in the woods, deep woods, the swamps, um, very inhospitable environments um, in order to live freely. And the largest um, maroon uh, societies were located along the Virginia-North Carolina border in what is known as the Great Dismal Swamp. Um, but there were other maroon communities in um, South Carolina and Georgia, in Savannah in particular, as well as in the lower Mississippi Valley in Louisiana and in parts of Florida. And in these spaces, um, enslaved women certainly faced um, challenging environments and inhospitable conditions. But the benefits of living independently and freely outweighed those challenges. And they were able to live in these societies. They live in these communities, certainly in a way that allowed them more freedom, but they were vulnerable communities and they were faced with um, assaults on their existence from local authorities who were seeking to uh, crush and disband these communities. Um, I talk about in my book um, the case of the Maroons in Savannah who were um, in South Carolina as well who were um, attacked by authorities um, because Maroons are trying to survive. So they're going to raid plantations to gain food and to, um, to live. And this created um, a great deal of um, uh, consternation to authorities who, you know, um, form militias to, to destroy the Maroon communities. So despite um the vulnerable circumstances that they faced, um, you know, the revolution does lead to the increase of marinage um, in places like the Great Dismal Swamp. And certainly African-American uh, women join these communities with their husbands, with their sons, and they were able to, uh, in many cases, um, enjoy some freedom, um, but again, it was a very, very vulnerable condition in which they lived. Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up or um, talk about the book? Well, I think in thinking about um, enslaved women's resistance and even thinking about the idea of marinage, I, I talk about in the book how Black women created what I call a rival geography, you know, uh, oh alternative way of um, knowing and using plantation and, and northern spaces um, that conflicted with enslavers' ideals and demands. So, um, you know, when we think about places like the Great Dismal Swamp and, and these deep woods and, and swamps in South Carolina and Georgia Low Country and in um, the Gulf region of Louisiana and Mississippi as well, it's important to, to underscore how creative and, I guess, resilient enslaved women were as they were seeking to create a life outside of bondage and to um, gain their, their freedom and sustain that freedom for themselves and their families. Yeah, um, and I think we really only scratch the surface um of of that process and and examples of that that you have in your book that are fantastic and it was really an education getting to talk to you and really enjoyed your book um so thanks so much for coming on and and i really appreciate it thank you for having me